So we're really fortunate to have Paul Lewin with us today. And um, Paul has always been involved with the arts, starting with painting at an early age. He attended the University of Montana, uh, where he focused on ceramics when working with Professor Rudy Audio. You guys all know Rudy Audio's work. Um, Paul received his undergraduate and graduate degrees from UN, and then moved to Seattle uh, first, making a living as a potter, and in 1986 began his ceramic tile business. Paul is known for his diversity of imagery, styles, and technique on his tile work. He is widely known for his exposure and glaze, or expertise, I'm sorry, in glaze chemistry, and is a master artisan in surface decoration. Paul actually wrote the book of China painting titled China Paint in Overplays. And I guess like that's the premier book on the subject. That's the only one. Right? Actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's genius. <laughs> um, he has had articles in all of the primary publications, including Ceramics Monthly, Studio Potter, and Clay Times. Paul has taught workshops on almost every, in almost every state in the Union and has work in the Colorado Springs Art Museum. And the mayor of Seattle presented one of Paul's tiles to the king of Sweden. Wow. And the queen of Denmark. <laughs> Impressive. And so I know that many of you have, you know, you have concerns. How am I going to balance life? being an artist, make money, survive, what it, should my journey be? So Paul's going to show us a little bit of his work, talk a little bit about his own personal experience in that area, and um, please help me welcome Paul Lewin. Thank you. Thank you. So, so this is a like professional practices class, which, God, I would have loved that when I was you know, we didn't have anything like that when I was going to school. Nobody even mentioned, like, making a living, you know, making art. And that was what I was always focused on. I, I did want to teach, but, um, but I decided when I was a little kid I was going to be an artist when I grew up. And I, and I didn't want to have, it was like, okay, it would be okay if I taught art, but that's it. I'm not doing anything else. I'm not going to have another job to support this. And even in fact, when I was here in school, a lot of, a lot of my friends were taking education courses so that they could get teacher certificates and have a, like a fallback position. And I never did that because for one thing, they'd tell me what they were doing in their art education, or in their education classes, and it all sounded really stupid. And, uh, <laughs> and I think I just sort of self-consciously or subconsciously didn't do that so that I would block that off as an option, <laughs> you know, <laughs> deny myself that out. And um, so, um, so I have a slideshow to show you and I'll go through it really quickly. I, I, I'm, I'm giving another slideshow this afternoon to the ceramic students. And the slideshow that I right? at three o'clock, yeah, and um, yeah, and it's down at the ceramics lab. And so, part of my slideshow is about my work, and the other half is about China paint, which is a ceramic medium. And you're probably not that interested in that, but I'll I'll run through the pictures really fast. It's 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 a it's a medium that almost no ceramic artists use these days. So it's to sort of familiarize them with what's possible in that medium. Um, but um, it's such a treat actually to be able to talk to people who are, who want to know about what it's like to make a living as an artist, because I almost never get that. So I'll go through the slideshow really fast and, and then we can talk about like what I did, what worked for me, what what I did that would not work anymore, that does not work anymore, um, you know, what advice I would have for you um, starting out now, because, you know, some of the things I've learned, um, some of the things I did I would, I would do again, 
other things I would do differently. And there are things that you can do now that I never had an opportunity to do. So, you know, so we'll go through that kind of stuff. Um, but I want to, and, and feel free to interrupt me anytime in the slideshow and if, if there's something you want to talk about. Um, so like I say, I'm gonna run through this pretty fast. And unfortunately, I think there's gonna be, okay, I'll move over here so I can see everybody. So I always wanted to be an artist. Uh, this is a drawing of mine from the third grade. And um, I, this is about the time I decided that I was gonna be an artist when I grew up. It's Noah's Ark. Right, <laughs> and, and I um, actually, like I said, I never really wanted to be anything but an artist, but that's not quite true. I also wanted to be a cowboy. So <laughs> this is, so I did this for three summers and one fall. I was a mule packer and a horse wrangler and a hunting and fishing guide in the Bob. And this is, um, anybody who's, anybody in here into the Bob? You've been in the Bob? You know Holland Pass? You've been in over Holland Pass? This is right on top of Holland Pass. And um, I worked out of Swan Valley and went in the bomb. And I learned how to pack mules, by the way, in a one credit PE course at the University of Montana. <laughs> like, believe it or not, I learned how to pack mules in college. And uh, so when I went off to college, so I started painting in oils when I was eight. And when I went off to college, I thought I was gonna be Thomas Moran when I grew up. And um, I still wouldn't mind being Thomas Moran. Um, but then these two guys um, came into my life, Rudy Audio on the left and David Shaner on the right. And Rudy was not making that stuff, the, the horses and naked ladies stuff, when I was in school. And I was here for seven years and actually he was making almost nothing at that time. He was drinking as a full-time job at that time. And, um, but, but I, like everyone else, loved Rudy. And so I switched to ceramics for a number of reasons, and Rudy was one of them. Um, but um, the other thing that, that really attracted me, and still does, is this kind of one big happy family thing that clay artists do better than anyone, any other group of people I have ever known in my life. They are just amazing how welcoming and open and sharing there are. So I never actually wanted to make the stuff like what Rudy was making. I wanted to make stuff like Dave Shaner, who um, lived up the road in Big Fork and was probably the best functional potter of his generation. And so these are my pots. And uh, I made a living making pots on the wheel for about 20 years. And uh, at uh, Cone 10, Reduction, High Fire, uh, Stoneware and Porcelain. But I was always really into decoration and painting and I developed this sort of style of painting with glazes and every one every color you see there is a different glaze and so it's um, so I got into making tile um, because the biggest paintings I could the biggest pots I could throw were you know yay big that's a really big pot but you know I wanted I wanted big I want it really big, you know, sofa size. Um, what's that? About like that. And uh, so I made those tiles uh, on a slab roller and I extruded the borders. And then this is a, a piece that I made. It's three by 12 feet. And this is one of the two pieces of public art I've ever made. And I hate public art. Uh, I hate doing public art. And uh, we can talk about that if because that's that's a viable option as a career by the way is making public art but it's a very specialized niche which i don't fit into um mostly personality my personality doesn't fit that um so i made this and then so i i had a studio i i, I left see i left montana because i didn't think i could make a living in montana as a potter at that time now I probably could, actually. And also I hate snow. And so uh, living in a tent in the Bob Marshall, like for hunting season, cured me of that. Um, so I, I, I went to Pottery Northwest in Seattle and I worked at Pottery Northwest for six years and then I had a rented studio with a gas kiln for about 10 years after that. And then I got evicted from that and I 
we sold the house that we lived in and we bought a bigger house where I could have a studio at home and I switched all electric. And this is the same kind of technique, but this is cone five oxidation. This is electric fired glazes. So I switched all my glazes to that. And I started doing these same glaze paintings uh, at mid-range oxidation. And this piece probably has 35, 40 different glazes on it most of which I invented myself. Um, and um, I still do some of this kind of work, um, but um, and this is all that. So when I, quit, when I moved into the bigger house, I decided that I was going to quit throwing and I was going to do nothing but tile. I was going to concentrate on the part of the process that I enjoyed the most which was the decorating and the painting. And um, so I decided that I would do custom tile murals and that I would do anything anybody wanted, any image, anything anybody wanted. And so I still do a number of these landscapes with the glaze painting, but it's very limiting. Um, you know, there's a, a not, I can get this effect and not much else. You got to make a lot of glaze tests to, to do this. This is, one day I decided I needed a picture of glaze tests, so I took some of the glaze tests that happened to be laying around the studio and took a picture. So this is, I've been kind of obsessive about this for 50 some years now. Um, and um, so this is China paint. And um, as I say, most, most ceramicists don't know what China paint is and have never seen it. But what it is actually is the lowest firing form of glaze that it's possible to make. It's fired down around cone 016, which is like 1400 degrees, which if you're into ceramics, you know, is very low temperature. Um, and it's usually done on an already glazed fired surface. And it's more like paint than any other ceramic thing you can do. You can get any color you want. You can get any effect you want. And the, the main thing for me was that I could work on commercial tile. So I don't make my own tile anymore. This is just, you know, dowel tile from, you know, Home Depot or something. Um, and I, like I say, I, and through the, the extensive art training I got at the University of Montana, I learned how to do lots of different techniques. And you can do almost any technique with China paint. So the, I didn't make the dinnerware. I just matched the dinnerware. So those, the tiles are, the, the grid is silkscreen printed, which I learned how to do here. And, and the flowers are hand painted. Um, and that's oriental sumi painting. Um, that's airbrushed. Um, and I have a little bit different kind of approach to making art than most people. I don't actually view art making as like a mystical kind of thing, you know, inspired by God kind of thing. It's, for me, it's about facility. It's about making marks and it's about what happens in my hand, you know. How, how things feel in my hand. That's, that's what, you know, that's the part I like. I don't, I don't like process my emotions or express my political views or anything like that through my art. Um, my, when, when I get to make art for myself, it's mostly landscapes and they're, they're pretty pictures. They're, they're commemorations of beautiful places I've been and nothing else. Um, you know, it, I, it just doesn't have intellectual content for the most part. What I'm really into is being able to duplicate any mark I see. And so I, so I can work in any style. And I, um, oh, I'll, I'll let you think about this. So, so now, I'll, I, like I say, I will paint anything you want. As long as it's not copyrighted to somebody else, I will paint anything on, on tile. So I'll give you a little challenge here. Um, people say, what's the weirdest thing you've ever painted? So you think about this. At the end of the hour, remind me. 
I'll tell you the weirdest thing anybody's ever asked for, and I guarantee you I'll top whatever you can think of. <laughs> think of the weirdest thing you could possibly want on your tile, and I will top that. So, quotes and portraits, it's like I say, I don't care. I'll, I'll paint anything. Um, and, you know, the, one of the secrets to making a living, making art, is you have to find you have to find a niche that suits you and I got you know I got this I got this talent which you know you obviously all have or you wouldn't be here um, I got the training to like be able to do all these different techniques and whatnot but the other thing I have is a personality that allows me to do commissions and a lot of artists don't have that if you don't have it you can't do it you know but I love doing commissions, and that's, that's really rare. So this, this niche, this business, this medium is like, it's exactly what I need, but almost nobody else fits into this niche. Which is kind of nice, because I don't have a lot of competition. Um, so <laughs> this is a weird one. This isn't even my design. The, the client had a friend who drew that central image, and this is a C monster, letter C. Everything in the picture starts with the letter C, right? <laughs> Everything in there starts with the letter C. And then she was really into word games, and she wanted two word games on the border, and the outer border is a calendar, and there are 40 different dates, like, holidays and family anniversaries and birthdays and whatnot starts with New Year's Day goes all the way around to Kwanzaa you know down in the corner you can see you know Columbus Day and Halloween and Election Day Veterans Day Thanksgiving Day AIDS Awareness Day and then for the inner border she wanted a real word game and that's all she told me she says, I want a word game this that has something to do with the letter C so this is my favorite kind of commission like something so weird so off the wall something I've never thought of before this is what I love so the word game is that there are these green green seas and there's a word inside the green sea that makes another word with the sea it's one word without the sea and another word with the sea so this is this is exactly the kind of weird stuff I love um, this is a map of Martha's Vineyard for this, it's in the back of a shower in a guy's cabin on Martha's Vineyard. And uh, a lot of my work comes through the internet now, through, through my website, it's all over the country. Um, these are these Neolithic cave paintings. Um, she wanted, she wanted that, that kind of an image and she wanted a story that went all the way around her four walls of her shower. So it's about hunting and death and rebirth and courtship and reproduction and hunting and death. And, and the, the handprints, some of the handprints are hers and some of the handprints are mine. So this is, you know, this is how I like doing commissions. It's like this, you know. Um, there's some more of this. Um, but most of what I paint with China paint is um, fairly representational kind of stuff. I paint a lot of food. I do a lot of kitchen backsplashes. Um, this is underwater sea. Um, Hawaiian fish. These people just gave me a list of Hawaiian fish. Um, there's the turtle. That's a close up of the turtle. Um, this is more for the ceramic students. This, the China paint is fired multiple times. And this is the first firing unfired, the first firing fired, the second firing fired, and the third firing fired and installed. Um, so um, these people said, we want an Amazon rainforest, no snakes, no bats, keep it under $2,500. <laughs> you got it. That's just about as much guidance as I like. You know, turn me loose. This is the biggest one I've ever done. This is 13 feet high and 40 feet long. And I loved it. I wished it were bigger. <laughs> and they said, you know, we want 
tropical fish, we want to shipwreck in it, and we really like seahorses. Go. <laughs> Some orcas in the bottom of your pool. Um, this is a Teton River over in eastern Montana and some sandhill cranes. And Mount Rainier, um, it's all trying to paint. This is uh, uh, the second biggest job I've ever done and it's impossible to photograph because it's a walk-in shower. And it's three walls of a walk-in shower. They are, each wall is five feet wide, the ceiling is 10 feet high. And the whole thing is painted. So like the water line is like, just above my head when I'm standing. The, 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 the salmon are about life size, right? And it's, um, another thing I really enjoy about doing this is that this is designed to be seen wrapped around you. It's not designed to be seen this way. It's designed to be experienced in, and so like the light sources, the, all the lights are, all the shading on everything is as if the light were coming through that window. You know, the window is the light source in the painting. Um, and she had a page and a half list of things, single, single space type list of things that had to be in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> Including a barnacle encrusted Rainier beer bottle down on the bottom. <laughs> so this is a church in California and um, the, some of the portraits, some of the kids are kids in their congregation. And some of them are kids in my family. <laughs> and th this is a, just a little hang on the wall piece. The, the, the tile in the center is 12 by 18 inches. And these are what I call rescued pots. These are pots I get from a second hand store and paint on them with china paint, refire them. And, and uh, they're really fun to do because I don't have to care what they look like. And uh, if I don't like them, I give them back. The second hand store. <laughs> so um, this is um, um, water soluble colored pencil. And my wife bought me these because she thought it would make better proposal drawings for my clients, which, which it does. Um, I, I do a, a scale drawing for almost everybody for a commission. And um, if your job is, say, $1,000 or less, you get a, a, a colored pencil drawing in my smaller sketchbook. And if it's like 1000 to 10000 you get a page in the really big one. And if it's like $10,000 or more, you get a, a, watercolor, a water soluble colored pencil on really good watercolor paper big, you know, because cause I, I charge by the square foot. So, you know, the, the big ones, I need a bigger piece of paper to do a proposal drawing for a really big picture. But, um, so I made a lot of these and I, and I tried selling them and whatnot and they didn't sell very well. And uh, my wife tells me it's a character flaw that I care so much whether people buy what I make or not. She says I shouldn't care, but I can't help it. And so I don't do these anymore because they didn't sell very well. So I started painting with acrylic paint. And this is, I'm doing quite a bit of this now. And I'm making about a third of my income these days off of painting. And uh, boy, is that a tough way to make a living. And are they pretty much all commissions or? No, um, some of them are commissions. Mostly they just, I just, they're almost all landscapes. Um, I get into, after the church job, I get into painting portraits and, and I'm really having a good time painting portraits, but it's really hard to find somebody who will pay you to paint a portrait. So I'm mostly just going, you know, you have a really interesting face. I'd like to paint you. Can I paint your portrait? So I just paint them because I like them. I like doing them. But, um, but I do, I've, I've sold those two big paintings. <laughs> you know? um, and then I occasionally just paint on walls, too. Um, combine the, them. Um, so that's kind of a rundown of, of, you know, this is the end of the part that's, that's mine. And from now on, it's, it's China paint. And this is, 
um, starts out with a history of China paint. This is what was happening in ceramics before they invented China paint in ceramics about a thousand years ago. And this is kind of the antecedents of it, you know, porcelain without the China paint and this um, overglazed stuff on low fire clay. And then the Chinese were the people who figured out how to make this overglazed stuff. And uh, these are two different families of colors of, of overglazed enamel or, or China paint. And, uh, then, and then they, these are Japanese factories that did the same thing. And um, I'm not gonna go into the great length on this that I'm going to go into on um, in the, with the ceramics people. This one I put in because Ninsei Nonomura is the first individual potter whose name we know. Before this, it was all anonymous factory workers, you know. Um, and then it, it, uh, it took the Europeans 700 years of trying really hard to figure out how to make porcelain after they first, after, after the Chinese made it. And it started coming to Europe almost immediately after the Chinese invented it. And Europeans tried for 700 years to figure out how to make it. And this is, my sen in Germany is where this guy finally figured out how to, how to do it. Um, and within about 50 years, everybody in Europe knew how to make it. Um, this is a French factory. Um, these are two guys who, th this was the second and third director of the Meissen factory. And the guy on the, on the right, Kondler, he's the guy who invented the ceramic figurine. You know, the, like uh, a small human figure statue. No one had done that before him. And so, you know, I'm sure I could go down to the ceramics lab and find people who are working in this tradition. You know, they're making small human figures. Well, he's the guy who invented it. Um, this is English. And then the Industrial Revolution comes along and um, this all gets mechanized and then it becomes a hobby. And especially in the United States, especially like from about 1875 to World War One, it was an incredibly popular hobby, particularly in the United States, particularly in the Midwest. And this is the man, this is like, you know, Chihuly in glass and Volkus in audio and ceramics and, you know, this is, this is the man. And this is another famous guy, another famous guy. Um, <clears throat> and then um, after World War II, there was a real revival of this medium. And these ladies were some of the people who were the main, the big names in the revival of it. Um, and you can see they're still, they were still trying to paint like um, Franz Bischoff, basically. There's still a lot of chi China painters trying to paint like Franz Bischoff. And these days, um, one of the problems in China paint is that almost all the people who are really into it are old ladies. And they don't have any young students. And, they're, they're, and there's this whole separate culture of China painters that has nothing to do with the clay artists. But they have this whole, you know, conventions and magazines and schools and stars and, you know, and is totally separate, no contact with ceramic mediums. And I'm really trying to change that. I keep telling those people that, I'm one of the few people who's part of both of these worlds. And so I keep telling them that I know where the next generation of their students is. It's here. It's in art centers. It's in colleges. It's in high schools. It's in it's ceramic students. Um, but they don't want to paint like that. So get over it. <laughs> and, um, these two ladies are still alive, but not painting anymore. And Rosemary Radmaker, um, Rosie the Rabble Rouser, she calls herself. She's about 92 now. And uh, she was the China painting advisor on this piece, wow. Judy Chicago's Dinner Party. This is one of the most influential art pieces of the 70s and probably the most influential piece in, if there is such a thing, feminist art. Um, 
And Jimmy Chicago really thought that this piece would revive China painting, and it didn't, because the China painters were so conservative, they were, and they were really offended by imagery like the primordial goddess. Um, so it didn't happen. Um, so when I started in ceramics in the mid-60s, the, the big thing in ceramics was a style called funk art. And this is another reason why I got into ceramics, because funk art, it happened pretty much in, in the West, in the US, mostly, on, mostly in California. And it only happened in ceramics. And basically, people were making jokes out of clay and getting famous making jokes. And I never actually wanted to make that stuff, but people who would make that are really fun to hang out with. And the, the potters, the potters were always having, they were like down there in that crummy little building away from everybody else, and they were having a ball. And they were, they were taking everything seriously except themselves. And they, they, they were the best cooks, and they were having the best parties, they had the best drugs, and they were just having a ball. So that was another reason why I switched from painting to clay. <laughs> <laughs> So um, uh, a lot of these funk artists didn't use China paint, but these guys used some. This is a, a guy who always did China paint and um, lusters and whatnot. And this is, this is like typical funk art, right? He made a lot of these, uh, you know, commercial decals. Um, this one, and they had, all had funny titles. This one's called Lookalikes. And like there was a whole series of based on Da Vinci's Last Supper, you know, like there was one where the figure of Jesus is missing and it's called Out to Lunch, you know, like <laughs> stuff like that, you know. There was another one where all the faces are Jesus, you know. And anyway, there. Um, this is one guy who is really famous in the clay world who did these overglaze designs um, sometimes. And uh, these are some contemporary American China painters. This is very typical of that. There's uh, some of the few guys in China painting. And uh, so you can see that, that this medium is it's really about painting. It's way more about painting than any other kind of ceramic thing you can do. Um, and there are all these substances and techniques that you can do after the, after the glaze firing. This is, this is the man today in America, this guy is like, he's the star. He's the biggest star in the, in the China paint world. He is unbelievable portraitist and unbelievable. These, these are about 11 by 14 inches. Um, a, lot, a lot of people paint portraits. Um, this is all done with a pen. So you can, you can use this, you mix this stuff up like ink and do it with a, like an old fashioned lettering pen. Um, this is the guy who's the, the best known in the clay art world as a China painter. He teaches at Arizona State University. And um, when I started writing my book on China paint, um, people in the clay world would go, so that's that stuff that Kurt Weiser uses, right? Like, yeah, that's the stuff that Kurt Weiser uses. And he was director of the Archie Bray Foundation over in Helena for a while. And actually, I was um, scheduled to teach a workshop with him, with this guy, just this past June at Anderson Ranch in uh, Colorado. And he got sick, and he had to bail out. And they had sold it as a two-person workshop. So it just so happened that one of the students in that class, one of the people who had signed up for the class, was Julia Galloway. And so she stepped in and we made the workshop partly about China paint and partly about form and design and imagery. And she did that part. And I, and I gotta tell you, I was blown away by Julia Galloway. I have never seen anybody that good at teaching. I wish I had had her for a teacher. She is just amazing, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And she started China painting now, so I'm really looking forward to seeing what, what she's going to do with it. But then, then this, these are all people who are China painting. And 
some people do like there's there's glaze there's underglaze there's overglazes there's luster there's a little bit of everything on these pieces um, and on this um, here's someone who's really working in that same figurine tradition she actually trained at my sand but these are big these are the figures are like this and uh, they're a little bit different subject matter than like 18th century German stuff. Um, this is a, another, this is probably the most famous internationally um, China painter. She's from Latvia, I think. And uh, it's probably all know Sam Chung. And this, this could be glazes or underglazes, but he chooses to do that bright color with China paint. Um, here's another guy who's getting real famous real fast. He's pretty amazing too. I want to teach a workshop with him because um, he's about as different from me as it's possible to get, you know. I'm an old white cowboy and, uh, you know, he's this inner city black and Puerto Rican guy and his work is all about social change and politics and whatnot. Mine's not, you know. Um, <laughs> so I really want to do one with him. Um, so this is, this is decal, and there are a couple of different kinds of decal. This is the kind you can print yourself, but then it's China painted over. And these are off the rack decals and some custom painted decals. And these are antique decals and decals that the guy has painted himself, printed himself. He, he printed the, the girls and the lettering himself. Um, there's a little bit of everything on these. Um, the, on the left is pots that this guy found in a secondhand store, and then he had those decals made of the Norman Rockwell paintings. And I always tell people that, I, I, that anything you can do with any form of paint or ink, you can do with China paint. And I thought I'd seen everything until this guy sent me these, the one on the right. So he takes paintball cartridges and sucks the paint out of them with a hypodermic needle and re-injects them with China paint and shoots these plate, paints plates with a paintball gun. <laughs> is that fun or what? And this guy China paints his raku. And this is soda fired and wood fired work that's been China painted on. Um, this is a whole series of disaster wear um, <laughs> this guy makes. And you know, like there's one for the Titanic, and there's one for the Hindenburg, and there's, you know. And then he um, scorches them with a blowtorch. That's what the, the, the black is just <laughs> hit with a blowtorch. This is, these are all secondhand plates too, and this, this is what this woman calls the Last Supper Project. And every plate is a picture of the last meal of a death row inmate. So a lot of people are doing, I'm surprised more people aren't doing tile with this. Um, the texture on the upper part of that plate is sandblasted through the china paint. And this guy <laughs> puts his china paint on really thick and dries it with a heat gun so it, so it peels like that. And it looks like old barn paint. And this is a, a different form of gold than the gold luster you're used to, which I'm not going to talk a lot about. And the rest of this slideshow is um, a, a very serious china painter a friend of mine and I did a slideshow together. And she, she this is her part of, the, of it, and it's all about various techniques and weird materials that China painters have that potters have never heard of and go, oh my God, you have what? Um, so I'm not gonna go into that kind of stuff, but these are all possibilities of what you can make this stuff look like. Um, this is, you, you dump your luster onto the surface of a bucket of water, and you take your piece and pull it up through the water, and you have like two or three different colors of colored luster. And it's just kind of random what comes onto your piece. This um, burnished gold is, it's a real time-consuming, tedious way of putting that gold on, but it's really, really lustrous and durable. And this is kind of how it goes. It's a multi-step process. This is incredibly tedious. This, I asked this woman how long it took her to make that plate, and she said about four months of working like pretty much all day, um, four months. 
Um, there's some more of this stuff. Um, and then this is what you can do after, after the gold is down. You're not even done at, then. Um, there are all these kind of pastes and dimensional things. This is kind of like iridescent, fired on colors. Um, this is dimensional. You can like little bumps kind of thing that you can feel on there. Um, different kind of pastes. Um, this is lots of stuff going on in that. One, you notice one of the ingredients on there is cat hair. Uh, and she just, the, the, the china paint's kind of sticky and wet because she used an oil-based medium. And so she just throws cat hair onto it while it's wet and it just sort of gathers and makes this fun pattern. Um, this is another kind of paste. Um, this is firing fiberglass cloth onto your pots and then painting over that. Um, and so this is some of the weirdest stuff. Let me go back one. The, the weirdest stuff is this stuff called chip-off powder. And they make this powder that you just mix up with a sticky medium. You put it on, on your already fired glaze and you fire it. And um, when it comes out of the kiln, it all chips off. And it looks like it's been chipped with a chisel. And then they usually gold luster over that. So it looks like crinkled foil. Weird, huh? And there's some more of it, like that. So um, this is a woman who was a student of Kurt Weiser's, and unfortunately she died at the age of 44, but she was going to be the, the absolute best at this. And this, I think, is what, this is what I would like to see China paint go toward, a, a medium you know, that forms that are made to be painted on, that have imagery that fit onto the forms and um, you know China paint's really good for imagery and uh, so anyway so that's here's all the good stuff <laughs> this is my wife and my dog in Mount Rainier I met my wife in the ceramic studio here at the University of Montana by the way and uh, you know it actually turns out that if you wait till I finish these glaze tests I'll buy you a beer is it actually works as a pickup line. <laughs> that, was, that was 48 years ago last Saturday. And we've been kind of inseparable since. And she said, her reply was, she was throwing. And I was making glaze tests. And she said, well, I'll have to go back to the dorm and change clothes first. And I said, no, you won't. I know a bar we can go to where everyone will be covered with either paint, ink, or clay. And so we went to a place called Eddie's Club, which is no longer here. It was this dive bar down, on, uh, down by the railroad depot that Rudy and Don Buncey drank at. And that's where we went on our first date. <laughs> so that's that. <laughs> so anyway, so we have till 11. Is that right? 10-2. 10 to Oh. 10 to 11. Not as much. Okay. So, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so, so much of your work, your tile work especially, has been commissions. Yeah. Right? And so could you go over or tell us a little bit about how you work the business into the commission? Do you, do you have a contract? Do you have so much down, so much... Um, yeah. I do not have a contract if I'm working with an individual. And almost all of my work is direct retail with homeowners. Um, and back before the recession hit, I was doing between 35 and 60 commissions a year. And, um, and I would never have a, a contract with an individual. If I'm working with a, a corporation, like a church or a, you know, a bank or a, you know, a corporation, then I have a contract. And I got the contract from there's an organization called Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts. And they have a standard contract. And you can modify it to you know, whatever terms you want. But all of the legal boilerplate is in there. And you know, all the protections you need is in there. Um, so that's, that's where I would do. Um, I also have a rule, by the way, which I learned the hard way about dealing with um, committees 
and you know sometimes there are like committees of 30 people or something that want to talk to you and my rule is I don't care how many people are on your committee I will talk to two people I will not talk to more than two people you make your decisions and you send two people to talk to me but I don't want to be there when you're hashing this out this is one of the reasons why I don't do public art because there's so much of that bullshit and it's like I don't mind you telling me what to paint but community input no 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 uh, no thank you not a hoop jumper um, so my deal with them is that um, I charge by the square foot I charge $144 a square foot which is probably low but it's easier easy to figure because it's a dollar a square inch and um, so what I tell them is you tell me you give me the measurements I don't go measure at your house you measure um, you give me the measurements and you tell me as exactly as you can what you want you show me anything pictures drawings just descriptions lists of things whatever you want and uh, I will make you a scale drawing so we all know what it, exactly what it's going to look like and how you know and a lot of times like there will be whole walls that are covered with tile but only some of them are painted I charge you for the ones that go in the kiln if it goes into the kiln it's $144 a square foot easy right um, do you install it as well? no I do not okay. that's another whole profession and I, I could have if, if I had decided to take up that profession um, you know I could have made more money on off of each of the of the commissions but that's hard work and I so like you okay, know. so you make all these tiles for the well I, let me let me go on so, so, so when they approve the drawing then I get half the money and um, and I don't buy tile or fire anything until I have a deposit and then I get the other half when they're happy with it and I guarantee they'll be happy with it if they're not happy with it I do it over and I have done that a number of times it's like comes out the wrong color it's not what I wanted it's fine no questions asked I do it over um, so that's how that goes um, so so what was your other question Right. And what if one gets broken or I, I re that Yeah, it does. I replace it. Okay. If, if I can have the broken pieces back, I can. There's another thing about China paint is it's pretty much the same before it's fired as it is after. So it's really easy to match. And, it, you know, if the tile setter breaks it, then he has to pay for it. If the homeowner breaks one, they have to pay for it. If it breaks in the firing, then I do it over and okay. they never know about it. So, yeah. Um, I have occasionally I, I turn down commissions when I can't do them um, but I've never turned anything down because of imagery um, I, I get people who say you know I've I've got this countertop and it's from the 40s and one of the tiles is broken can you match that no no one can match that <laughs> so I turn down stuff like that or if it's you know if if it's um, if if they want something that's in a style or technique that I can't do, like if they really insist on it, it has to be Cuerda Sica, which is a tile making technique that I don't do. It's like no, I don't do relief tiles, um, I don't do floor tiles, um, but I've never turned anything down for imagery. So you don't do art, you said you no, I I don't like hoop jumping and also the other thing about public art is that the people who get public art jobs are the people who get public art jobs it's very hard to break into it's it's really good once you get established as as someone who does public art but it's really really hard to get started doing public art um, so um, and and often the money is not as good as it sounds like you know it's by the time they 
you have to be careful about what they are going to require you to do and provide and whatnot. And you know, by the time you hire an engineer and hire uh, you know someone to document it, and you you know buy the insurance that they insist on, and you you know all this kind of stuff, and go to all the meetings and whatnot. And if it's not local, you know you're doing a commission in Georgia or someplace. Well going to the meetings is, you know, that's expensive. They don't pay for that. That comes out of, out of your fee, you know? So you have to be really careful about, it's like, yeah, there's $100,000 for this, you know? And you spend a year on it and spend, you know, $70,000 producing it. It's like, yeah, you've made $30,000 and worked all year. Like, no thank you. <laughs> Um, I don't travel. I ship him. I ship them. And I, I get most of my commissions, nowadays I get them mostly through the website, but for many years, I, I've had a booth at the Seattle Home Show. Um, you know, me and the vinyl siding guys and the, you know, the roofers and whatnot. And that was really, really good. It's, it's getting less and less good. Um, like I say, I, you know, when, when I started out, almost everything that worked, when I started out as an artist, it doesn't work anymore. Art fairs, um, galleries, shops, and whatnot. It's like, I used to have a really thriving wholesale business, and all those shops are gone now. Um, the fairs aren't worth doing. Um, it's like, I, like as far as marketing your work and whatnot, it's like, I'm sorry, I don't know how to do it anymore. Um, there are too many of them, and, they, and they're all too big. You know, they all think that... that um, too many vendors? Too many vendors, yeah. Yeah, the, the pie gets divided up too small. They all think that, that if they have more vendors, it'll be a better fair. It's like, no, it's better for you. You get more, you get more entry fees, but, you know, it, and, unless you bring in more customers... <laughs> it, it's worse if there are more vendors. So, um, you know, all this like internet marketing stuff, I don't get it. I don't know how to do it. So, um, were you trying to do, uh, like you talked about being an artist in both worlds, you know, like the China painting world and, and even this sort of client commission world, but also just as the artist yourself. Were you, at the same time you, that you were, selling pots at fairs, uh, doing these commission works. Were you also trying to navigate in the exhibition world? Like yeah. Galleries yeah. And, and that sort of thing? Yeah. Um, I've always been of the opinion that you should do everything. Um, David Shainer was, as I said, he was my hero. There's, there was a whole group of us, a whole generation of potters who wanted to grow up to be David Shainer, you know? Kurt Weiser wanted to grow up to be David Shainer. Josh DeWeese wanted to grow up to be David Shainer. I wanted to grow up to be David Shainer. And David, he made sculpture, he made functional pots, he did stoneware, he did wood fire, he did gas firing, he wrote, he taught, he was an administrator, he was, you know, it's like he did everything. Um, he, he was a brilliant glazed guy, and he's the only other potter I know who like had 40 different glazes around his studio all the time like I did. And I do it that way because David did it that way. And he also shared all those recipes with everyone, so I do that too. Um, so, you know, you, when, before you get into this, you don't really know what you're gonna be good at and you don't really know what you're gonna like, but what you're gonna be good at and what you like is the same thing. So do what you like, because that's what you're gonna be really good at. You know, and if you, if you absolutely cannot stand up in front of a crowd and speak, don't be a teacher, you know? If you absolutely cannot adapt your art to what other people want, you're not going to want to do commissions. But you're not going to know until you try it. 
You know, you're not going to try it, know until you try it a few times. So I've always done like some wholesale, some retail, some consignment, some commissions, some, you know, some writing, some teaching. I know that I'm terrible at administration, so I try not to do that. But, you know, I've done like committee work, like board of director kind of things. And, you know, it's like you might be really good at that. Um, so, yeah. Well, I, I switched from painting to ceramics for a number of reasons. And like I say, you know, the potters were way more fun than anybody else. That was one thing. And then there was Rudy. And I got really seduced by what throwing feels like. And it also, and I, and I have always really loved the chemistry. And you get to play with fire. You know, <laughs> this is way fun. Playing with fire is really fun. Right? I mean, I have a f friend who says if he hadn't become a potter, he would have become an arsonist. So, <laughs> um, you know, there, there are people who are making pots solely so that they can play with fire. Um, there are other people who are making pots solely so that they can play with mud. Um, you know, I, I was kind of a combination of things. But, um, but another thing was that it looked like it was going to be easier to make a living making pots than it was selling paintings. And that was probably true. And I really liked the idea that I could make something that anyone could afford. It was like art for the masses. I really liked that idea. I still like that idea. What I do now is not that, but. Um, well, I, I, like I said, I made pots for about 20 years and um, at the end of m when I was throwing, um, I was actually getting a little bored with throwing. And there are lots and lots and lots of really good potters in the Seattle area. And I look around and I go, you know, Rito Zaki, Ginny Conroe, Lauren Lukens, Jamie Brooke. It's like, I'm never going to be as good a thrower as those people. And, but I can decorate better than anybody. You know, I can paint better than anybody. And I kind of wanted to go back to painting. I wanted, you know, bigger paintings. So that was kind of it. And I was, and, and my back hurt all the time. And my wrists hurt all the time. And my elbow hurt all the time. And um, so um, I, I started making tile. And I was making more and more tile and getting more and more interested in it. And I get evicted from my studio. They tore the building down. And, um, and that was what really precipitated stopping throwing, changing firing temperature, moving, going into the tile business. So, yeah, yeah, you had, you had a question. No, I can ask questions. I just want to get other people into it. Yeah, so you mentioned that the way that you started selling your work to begin with with fairs and that kind of stuff doesn't work anymore. So what do you do to get people to buy your commissions? You say you have your website, you don't right. do that. Yeah, I, I push that website as much as I can. Okay. And you know, they tell me I should do Pinterest and Instagram and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, I don't get it. Do people Actually, if you, if you want to know how to do that, um, you go down to the ceramic studio and you find one of the graduate students named Amanda Barr. That's who I ask. She, she has just started graduate school here. She was a resident at Pottery Northwest in Seattle before she came here. And I've been asking her for the last couple of years. <laughs> so go, go talk to Amanda if you want to know about that stuff. Um, you know, like Etsy and, you know, I don't get it. Um, but there, there are still fairs that work. Um, but whether they're here or not, I don't know. But it's a lot of work. You know, especially if you're making pots. Um, it's a little easier. To, I don't know if anything, any medium is easier than any other. You know, the paintings are incredibly hard to sell because there's so much competition. And you go, you go do an art fair with paintings and wind is a real consideration. 
they're all sales, you know? Um, I helped out, a, the potters are always jealous of the jewelers, you know, because the jewelers can, it's like, pack everything in their briefcase and walk out through the crowd at the end of this. It's like, yeah, but you know, if you're, if you're a potter, you don't have to watch every single one of your pots at every second through the entire weekend like the jewelers do. So, you know, nobody steals pots. <laughs> nobody wants them, that's why. No, anyway. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's kind of hard to say. They, they kind of like diverged. A um, hundred years ago, if you went to art school and learned ceramics, you would have learned China painting just as, you know, you would have learned about glazes, you would have learned about molds, you would have learned about throwing, you would have learned about China paint. And it just sort of diverged. And I think one of the reasons it diverged was, um, you know, <laughs> I, Rudy never had anything to do with China paint. I mean, he knew what it was, but he had never used it. But I actually said in my book that Rudy and Pete and some other people like Paul Soldner and Don Rice and whatnot, they had a huge influence on the history of China painting. They drove an entire generation away from it because real men play with fire. Real men fire to Code 10. And there was really a lot of that macho thing going on. In the, and the China painters are mostly women and mostly older women. You know? and, they're, and they're not making the things they paint on, generally, which is sneered at. And the China painters are kind of afraid that they'll be sneered at by the potters. And the, and the potters kind of think, China paint, you know, I don't want to paint pink roses. It's like, to which I say, it's paint. It doesn't get to decide. I it's get to, I get to decide. You shook well, those ones at the end had all that wonderful texture. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just to use as a material, yeah. not so much for imagery, but for yeah. material. Yeah. Yeah. That's the other thing that I mean they're they're so separate. The the clay artists have no idea what's possible. Mm -hmm. So um yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kurt told me that when he when he he's never had a lesson in China paint, by the way, in China painting, by the way, and neither have I, and neither has Bridget Harper. We all just made this up. Okay, so you can do this. It's it's not hard. Um, but Kurt, when he started, knew absolutely nothing about it, and he didn't even know what to mix his paints with. The paint generally comes as a dry powder, and then you mix it with some kind of a medium, and. Uh, so he went to this China painter's studio in Arizona and he bought some of her medium and it's the only medium he's ever tried and it's still what he uses. And um, he said he went back after about six months and showed this well-known China painter what he was doing and the woman said, huh, you're a university professor, huh? <laughs> it felt like that. <laughs> There's a hierarchy everywhere. Yeah, there is. Yeah, yeah. So, um. wow. so Paul, we only have about five more minutes, but you. I actually, I have some other advice for you that okay. I've really been I thinking, really been watching. thinking. Oh yeah, there's that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> one, one is about money. You know, and it's like, if you're in this for the money, forget it. You're probably not going to get rich at this, right? But it is really possible to have a good life and like a middle class existence as an artist. The starving artist, I hate that starving artist bullshit. It's like, no, I don't want to starve. It's like, you know, I got, you know, 20 years experience, two degrees, and it's like, there's no reason why I should be making less than a bus driver. So let's, come on, this is a much harder thing to do, right? Um, so don't undervalue what you do. Um, but you do have to treat, you have to think about money in a different way than most people. It's like, I have never had a budget. 
I don't make budgets. What I do is, when I have money, I pay all my bills. I pay all my bills as soon as I can, which is sometimes is, you know, <laughs> a little bit late. Sometimes it's like right away. When I have money more than my bills, I put it away someplace in a savings account, and I try really hard to forget it's there. You know, I'll go get it if I absolutely have to. I have a savings account. I could not tell you today how much money is in it because I don't look. Right? If I need it, I go get it. But I try and leave it there as long as I can. That's how I deal with money. Okay? Now, I'm, I'm married, right? And my wife has always had a job. And one of the, one of the things that everybody has always told us as artists, like one of the best things you can do is marry well. <laughs> and, and I did that. I married really well. Uh, I married another artist, which is, has its good parts and its bad parts. But I did want to tell you there is one thing that is true now that was not true when I was starting out. And that is that one of the components of marry well has always been marry someone who has a job with benefits. You know the joke about a, 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 um, a, a, an amateur artist is a guy who has another job so he can make art? A professional artist is a guy whose wife has another job so he can make art? <laughs> right? That's, you know, that's still true, okay? But right now, like I had no control over that when I was starting out, but right now, you guys have a chance to make a difference in that. Like marrying someone with benefits. This election cycle and the next election cycle, there are people who want to make that easier for you, and there are people who want to make that harder for you, right? So vote, especially in Montana. This election, I mean, in, in like a month, it will make a huge difference to how easy it is for you to start a business, whether you are able to afford health insurance or not. So vote. Okay, now, what was your other question? What was the weirdest thing? Oh. <laughs> so this woman comes to me and she wants, she's doing a steam room. And she wants one 12 by 24 inch tile on each of the four walls. And three of the four walls, she wants me to duplicate these bizarre tattoo designs that she has collected. And she has all these pictures, and there are about 20 of them. And they look like they're just like people's tattoos that she's maybe shot with her cell phone, maybe without them even knowing. But one of them, <laughs> just as an example, one of them is this black frog with big claws that looks like he's like sliding down the wall and leaving bloody claw marks behind him. And he has this big red flower coming out of his butt that has a butterfly in it that has a, in the blossom that has a woman's face on it. Um, so that's one of the tattoo designs. They were all kind of like that, but they were not the weird part. Oh. <laughs> the weird part was that on the fourth tile, she wanted photorealist portraits of her 13 favorite serial killers. And I guarantee you, whatever you thought of as the weirdest thing, in the, it was not that weird, right? <laughs> so I, I told her I couldn't, I, I told her I couldn't do it because I, I couldn't do photorealist anything, and I wasn't doing portraits at that time. And besides, she wanted 13 portraits on a tile this big, and I charged by the square foot, and it's like, I'm sorry, lady, I'm not doing 13 portraits for $300, right? But I told her the dye transfer process that she would have to use to do this, and I told her where she was going to have to buy that tile. And the next time I went down to the dial tile, dial tile showroom, the guys in Will Call said, you know that lady you told us about? It's like, <laughs> she's doing it. She came, she got, she found some. It's like, so there's a steam room out there someplace that looks like that. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much.
much for sharing. And I, I, I have time if anybody, you know, if you guys have, have to go, if you don't have to go, I have time if you want to talk some more. So, if, you have, um, if you have other questions. Just to remind everybody, Paul will be speaking again at 3 o'clock in the ceramics studio right. and maybe going a little bit more in depth with ceramic speak. Yeah. Um, and, and then also, as a reminder, it, Jesse's opening is tonight at the UC Gallery, 4 to 6, right? Okay. So um, please make a point of trying to stop by to support Jesse and check it out. And your artist bio is due today. And oh god, what else is going on? It's like First Friday. It's, it's <coughs> on the homecoming hoopla that you have to be a part of. Yeah, and I get to ride in the homecoming parade. Oh, <laughs> 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 Yeah, I'd be happy to talk to you about resumes and bios and that kind of crap too, if you want.